So, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you my, my work. And also, I want to thank you all for being the last survivors of this meeting. Uh, and I'll do my best, I promise, to keep you awake. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, if you can, please follow me. My talk is about uh, supermassive black hole binaries. So why should you care about supermassive black hole binaries? Well, my personal answer is that they are the most fascinating astrophysical object. But maybe you want something more. So let's say something more. We know from cosmology, we think we know, that galaxies aggregate through repeated mergers. And also, from the observation of high redshift quasars, we, we think that uh, supermassive black holes uh, inhabit the centers of galaxies from really early times. So if we put together these two facts, when the two galaxies merge, we expect a supermassive black hole binary to form and to evolve in the center of the merger remnant. And what happens after the merger? So first of all, we expect the two black holes to inspire due to dynamical friction that is a sort of gravitational drag. And this happens down to a few parsecs scale. At this scale, dynamical friction is no longer efficient, typically. And we need something else in order for the binary to further shrink. And this something else is a dynamical effect that is very important and uh, is uh, slingshot ejections. So the binary will be surrounded by a lot of stars. Every time a star comes close enough to the binary that it can interact with it, we have this interaction. Typically, the star is literally ejected from the center of the system because the binary gives energy to it. And in the interaction, the binary shrinks. And through a series of these episodes, we hope the binary will manage to shrink from uh, a few parsec scale down to the milliparsec scale. Why this, why this scale? Well, I think we, most of us know that if we can reach about a milliparsec scale, then two supermassive black holes can enter the gravitational wave emission regime and they will coalesce, they will merge in a burst of gravitational wave emission. And this is uh, extremely important because uh, we all wish we will observe these signals in the future, maybe with the pulsar timing array, or hopefully also with uh, the LISA mission. And uh, these observations are cu crucial because uh, we hope we will uh, learn a lot more about uh, how supermassive black holes evolve, about our cosmological paradigm. But, well, I hope I convinced you that, that uh, we need a lot of uh, interactions with uh, stars for the binary to shrink down to the gravitational wave emission phase. And in the beginning, it seemed that uh, this was not possible, or at least not sure. Uh, because uh, in order for the binary to go from one parsec to a milliparsec, you, you need that, that stars continuously go down to the binary. And uh, this, was, uh, this problem has been known as the final parsec problem. And the people have uh, worked a lot in order to find uh, possible solutions. And a lot of solutions have been proposed. I mentioned here the gas drug. So if our black hole binary in, is in a gas-rich uh, environment, the gas drug can help the binary to shrink. Also, if there is a massive perturber, uh, as for instance, uh, giant molecular cloud uh, or another lower mass, uh, intermediate mass black hole in the surroundings, these objects can scatter stars on the supermassive black hole binary. But I think nowadays the most compelling way to, to solve the final parsec problem and the reason why we think there, it is no longer a problem is the fact that uh, uh, galaxies are non-spherical. They are never perfectly spherical. And if galaxies are non spherical, uh, several uh, works uh, have shown that basically uh, the large scale torques can always funnel stars in the center of the galaxy 
and the, the binary will reach the gravitational wave emission, at least uh, in the large, for large amounts of uh, supermassive black hole binaries. But I'm here because I want to propose another possible method uh, to boost the binary shrinking in order for it to emit gravitational waves. And this is the disruption of a star cluster by the supermassive black hole binary. Why am I proposing this? Well, first of all, we know that uh, young massive uh, star clusters exist. We know that they are quite common in galactic, uh, in galactic uh, centers. So for instance, our own galactic center that I showed there hosts uh, two young massive star clusters that are the quintuplet and the arches cluster, and they are a few tens of parsecs from the Sagittarius A star. So we know they exist. And also, if we think that we need a galaxy merger to form a supermassive black hole binary, we can also think to the fact that uh, galaxy mergers generally trigger star formation bursts. And this burst of star formation may form, in fact, the clusters that then are going to infall onto the supermassive black hole binary. So this is uh, the question we asked ourselves. May the infall of a stellar cluster enhance the binary shrinking? And well, I will give you the answer soon. Uh, to tackle this problem, uh, we use the direct summation and body simulations of a star cluster in falling, literally, on the massive binary. And uh, we take uh, two kind of Milky Way-like supermassive black holes, because uh, there are two black holes with 10 to the 6 stellar masses. And we model the cluster with uh, about 10 to the 5 solar masses. Uh, we put the binary separation at about one, par at one parsec, because this is the order of the separation at which the binary shrinking becomes more difficult. And uh, the cluster binary separation is uh, 20 parsec. And we integrate this system, also including a, a rigid potential to take into account the galactic background, uh, with the high GPUs, th that is a code that has been uh, written by Mario Spera, who spoke uh, a few minutes ago. And uh, we explored this parameter, the parameter space uh, to uh, understand what happens if these clusters infold on the binary with three different configurations. In the first one, we try to understand where the, what happens if the Cluster is literally in a free fall, has a radial infall, but its infall is perpendicular with respect to the binary orbit. In the second one, we use the same configuration as the first, but the difference is that in this case, uh, the, the cluster is on the same plane of the supermassive black hole binary. And in the third case, we include some angular momentum in the orbit of the star cluster. So it is the same as this second one, but uh, the cluster is not longer in free fall, but it has an eccentricity of 0 0.75. Okay, uh, now I sh should show you the simulation, sorry, but this is a PDF, so it's a bit tricky. <laughs> Okay, so in this first, you saw the cluster. It, it, is, it was in, in falling onto the supermassive black hole binary, and uh, you probably noticed it was immediately disrupted. The disruption was very, very fast, and the interaction was kind of strong, I would say. And then, let's see the same thing, what happens when the same cluster infalls with some angular momentum. So, the evolution is definitely different because we don't have this strong interaction. The star cluster kind of keeps its shape, its shape for a longer time, and it will evolve around the, the supermassive black hole binary. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you guessed it, the two points in the center. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and if you wait uh, for long enough, I don't think we have time, uh, basically this star cluster will, will form a disk-like structure with three a tree lobed over density. And, okay, so let's go back to the PDF. Uh, 
Okay. Um, but let's go now to the quantitative stuff. So here I show you what happens to the binary separation. Uh, so the separation between the two supermassive black holes is shown as a function of time. This black line shows the uh, separation evolution when the fall has some angular momentum. So the second simulation I showed you. As you can see, the binary separation is initially at one, and at the end, it's basically again at one. This means that if the infall of the cluster has some angular momentum, then the, the cluster infall is not really efficient in shrinking the binary. On the other hand, if we take in account the other two configurations uh, I explored that are the two radial infalls, one I showed before, uh, the binary shrinking happens and uh, you can see that at the end of the evolution, so after about 10 mega years, uh, the binary has, has shrunk 13 to 15 percent. This is not bad at all. Uh, and uh, this means that the, the shrinking, the cluster can in fact boost the binary shrinking if the orbit is the right one. And also, this also means that maybe if we can uh, um, throw not just one, but more clusters on the supermassive black hole binary, the supermassive black hole binary will may, may shrink of its semi-major axis of an order of magnitude. And what happens, in fact, to the star cluster? What happens to the binary? So I need to define what is the loss cone. Maybe a few of you already know, but uh, the loss cone of the binary is uh, that uh, sample of stars uh, that uh, are going to have low angular momentum, angular momentum low enough that they can reach the binary and interact with it. So I plot in this plot uh, the fraction of stars inside the loss cone, the fraction of respect to the total of the cluster, as a function of time. So what happens in this plot? I show the two lines that are the radial coplanar in full and radial perpendicular. I don't show the eccentric case because basically all stars are at zero. So <laughs> there is no proper interaction. In the beginning, you see that there is a jump in the number of stars inside the Los cone. This is because uh, the binary potential strips the, the star cluster and funnels the stars on radial orbits and they are going to interact with the binary. Then, oh sorry, at some point the binary interaction happens, that is roughly here, and the binary starts kicking away stars. The slingshot ejections are in place now. And uh, the slingshot ejections uh, have a, a role because uh, you see this trend, the fraction of stars inside the lost cone go down, 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 and this means that the binary uh, is shrinking in this way and uh, the lost cone is being depleted, it's been emptied. But now let's look a bit to the structure of the star cluster. This is the density profile of the stellar cluster uh, of my simulations. This is the initial profile of the cluster centered on its center of mass. And the, the other curves show the density profile of the cluster at the end of the interaction for the radial configuration and the eccentric one. What happens? It happens that the binary uh, does the job because uh, you see here uh, the density profile uh, is uh, cored. So stars are actually kicked away from the center by the binary effect. Uh, another thing I, I want to mention is that uh, at larger scales, uh, the density profile of this uh, stellar cluster around the supermassive black hole binary goes as uh, r to the minus 2. And this is something that uh, we are happy to find because it's something that is common. Even if you throw a cluster onto a single supermassive black hole, you end up with something like this. So it's something that we would expect. And also the last thing I want to tell you is that um, uh, this interaction has uh, some interesting effect, meaning that uh, some stars are actually kicked away by the binary with a really, really high velocity. They are not many, because in this plot I show you, uh, this means they are about 10, but they may attain velocities from uh, 600 to 6,000 uh, kilometers per second. So these are generally hypervelocity stars. 
and uh, yes, I just say this. And these are my conclusions. Uh, we tried to throw a star cluster onto a supermassive black hole binary exploring different orbits. And uh, the main result is that if the star cluster impulse with the some angular momentum, then it is not really efficient in shrinking the binary. On the other hand, if the cluster has some angular momentum, the binary shrinking can be important. It can be of the order of 10, 15%. And uh, this interaction is also efficient in producing some hypervelocity stars. And uh, here I finish, and I thank you very much for your attention. Any questions before to close? Hey, I have a curiosity. So, uh, what is the, can, can you, in some sense, guess the probability that you have some impact parameter, non-zero impact parameter. I mean, you'd have no, not a radial uh, uh, encounter, but because if, uh, if directions are more or less random, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really ignorant. Uh, then it's difficult to think that mm. I, I would uh, expect a probability of, of a radial uh, encounter quite low. But do, do you have a reason to expect that this radial Okay, encounter yes. is, is, is important. Okay, so uh, I, I asked if, if I understood correctly. You are curious to understand whether this radial infold is something that may happen or it is like so rare that we y want yes, to Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you very much. So, well, this is a totally good uh, question. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there are, oh, I wrote it here. So, Nearly uh, radial orbits can be produced, uh, for instance, by collisions between molecular clouds. And uh, this uh, collision uh, may trigger the formation of a cluster that will become, in fact, the cluster that will fall onto the binary. And uh, also, we, uh, this paper from Tsuboy et al., uh, 2015, observed that uh, star formation in the galactic center may, in fact, be triggered by uh, collisions between molecular clouds. So this uh, would mean that uh, it is not as rare as uh, we may think. So, yeah, uh, I would say like that. So, any Other questions? questions? Okay. No, so we can, thanks again. And Thank you. we... We can close the session and the workshop. Thanks uh, to all.